Okay, happy Mother's Day, Mom. Happy Mother's Day. It's so much fun having my mom live close to me. That was not the way for a long time, but it's fun. It's Mother's Day. And as he said, that sometimes is very difficult, um, which I find it ironic, funny, um, all the things that Mother's Day falls during our series, Thriving Under Pressure. Moms kind of know a little bit about maybe just surviving under pressure. That's kind of where I feel like I'm at at this point because it's the end of the school year. Thank the Lord. There's 10 days of school left, not that we're counting or have a giant countdown in my classroom. Well, I do, I started that countdown every day. I'm like, look guys, there's only 10 more days. Hallelujah, thank Jesus. That's because I'm Westfield, I'm sorry for Noblesville. They have longer, I'm so sorry, Sherry. But the end is in sight. And as the year continues to go, we feel the pressure, we feel the end of the year with all of the assignments where you're just saying, please just click submit, please just click submit. And of course, all of the um, state mandated testing has to be done at the end of the year. So you have all of the assignments plus the testing that they have to do, which means they all come home slightly crazy because they've been testing all day. And then the text messages from teachers saying, don't forget to charge your Chromebooks and please send this in and please send that and please sign this um, field trip form. That would be great if you would remember to do that. And then there's graduations of all shapes and sizes and you have to look up Pinterest boards to see how you're supposed to decorate and what you're supposed to do. And the little sheets you're supposed to now print off for the last day of whatever their grade is, and the confetti poppers, and I am not that mom. <laughs> Thankfully, I have a neighbor who is, and she's great. She'll print everything off and just show up the last day of school, and here, have your kids hold this, take their picture, you'll be fine. <laughs> Thank you, because I'm like treading water and doing great that they're fed and clothed, and they keep making dirty clothes. And I've asked if you guys would just, you know, stop. That'd be great, but there is the alternative, which is not so great, so keep doing laundry. Keep making dishes, because that's great. That's what we love to do. Pressure, there's a lot of pressure. Can I get an amen from the moms out there? Yeah, but as this series is um, showing us, there's pressure even when you're not a mom. And there's, so imagine all this pressure that we have as mom, but then compound it when you're just a Christian who's in, not really just a Christian, but when you're a Christian in an ever-increasing pressure cooker and you feel like the world is changing around you and things are different and sometimes things don't even look like the place where you thought that you were and it just feels sometimes like it's a lot and it's a lot and it's a lot, which is why I love that we're studying the book of Acts because it's encouraging I mean, we've been hearing amazing stories the past few weeks of, um, I mean, the church growing, the church thriving under pressure. And it's been some kind of really cool stories like Samaritans, where they were thrilled to find out that they are now invited back into the family. Like, they're back in the fold. They thought there was no hope for them, and they found out there's hope. Rejoicing, party, woohoo! And then last week we talked about the Ethiopian eunuch who was seeking like he was so ready for the gospel, so excited and was like, please teach me. Like those are moments when you're like, I can share the gospel with people like that. Like that's easy. Like they're just, like Jerome said, bump, set, just come in for the dink. You're like, it's a great move right there. And I don't see those, I would, I would love that. That would be awesome if every time that I, I knew I should share the gospel with someone that it would be that easy. But it doesn't always feel that easy at least for me. Sometimes, sometimes there are people, situations, that make it slightly more difficult, intimidating, people that you know you should share the gospel with, but you don't even like being around these people. The neighbor who kind of picks on everything and may or may not be on the HOA and may or may not be measuring people's grass to make sure it's the right length. Those kind of people that you're like, I don't even know 
if I'm being particularly honest, I don't know if I want to spend eternity with you and have, I should tell you about Jesus, but I might let somebody else do that. And even if it's not just your neighbor, maybe it's like even worse if it's somebody you work with who knows exactly what you believe and they don't believe that way. And so their mission is to either make your life miserable or to make you leave or better yet, get you fired. Those aren't really people that you're like, I should really sit down with them and have some tea and talk about my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's not like on your list of things to do today because you're probably like, I really don't even like that person. I'm, I'm good. I don't need, we, we feel that pressure. And, and that's just like surface stuff, which when it's your job, it doesn't feel like surface stuff. But then there's increasing and other layers and other layers and other layers that can kind of start to feel like you're, under pressure. And there are times and people and moments where you think, well, that's not really a Book of Acts moment because all these Book of Acts moments have been so triumphant and really set up for awesomeness. And I'm dealing with those people and that make you want to walk away and say, I need to go be with Jesus because I'm not nice right now and I don't really like you people. And, and so the good news is we are at that point in the book <laughs> in the story where we start learning about one of those guys that nobody was wanting to invite over for tea and crumpets to talk about the gospel. The guy that everyone was actually running away from because he was causing all of the problems. This guy is Saul of Tarsus. So we've made it all the way to Acts 9. And while you turn there, um, let me just tell you a little bit about Saul. He was one of the men present at the stoning of Stephen, and Acts 8.3 describes him as, Saul was going everywhere to destroy the church. He went from house to house dragging, not politely asking, but dragging out both men and women to throw them into prison. There's a tea and crumpets kind of guy. So let's pick it up in Acts chapter nine. We're gonna read one through 19. Meanwhile, Saul was uttering threats with every breath and was eager to kill the Lord's followers. So he went to the high priest. He requested letters addressed to the synagogues in Damascus, asking for their cooperation in the arrest of any followers of the way he found there. He wanted to bring them, both men and women, back to Jerusalem in chains. As he was approaching Damascus on this mission, a light from heaven suddenly shone down around him, he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. And the voice replied, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men with Saul stood speechless, for they heard the sound of someone's voice but saw no one. Saul picked himself up off the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he was blind. So his companions led him by the hand to Damascus. He remained there blind for three days and did not eat or drink. Now there was a believer in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord spoke to him in a vision calling Ananias. Yes, Lord, he replied. The Lord said, go over to Straight Street to the house of Judas. When you get there, ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. He's praying to me right now. I have shown him a vision of a man named Ananias coming in and laying hands on him so he can see again. Oh, but Lord, exclaimed Ananias, I, I've heard many people talk about the terrible things this man has done to the believers in Jerusalem. And he's actually authorized by the leading priests to arrest everyone who calls upon your name. But the Lord said, go, for Saul is my chosen instrument to take my message to the Gentiles and to kings as well as to the people of Israel and I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. So Ananias went, and he found Saul. He laid his hands on him, and he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road, has sent me so that you might regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Instantly, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he got up and was baptized. Afterward, he ate some food and regained his strength. That's kind of crazy. Like, I love a good story. I love reading novels. I'm not in the time of my life where I get to sit down with a good book very often, so Audible is my favorite app on my phone. 
because I can play my books while I'm cooking, doing all the laundry, and which, to be fair, my kids do their own laundry because, ew. <laughs> so I love Audible. I love a good story. This is an insane story. Like, we, it's easy for us to just read through and be like, Meanwhile, Saul was uttering threats with every breath, and he was eager to kill the Lord's followers. <laughs> it's easy for us. It's black and white. It's these little bitty words on a page, and we're like, oh, that's interesting. Let's, let's look back at verse 1. Ah. Meanwhile, Saul was uttering threats with every breath, and was eager to kill the Lord's followers. So he went to the high priest. He was eager to kill people. Man, this guy's intense. Kind of seems a little off his rocker. He's really, really, really intent on killing people. This is where we're at in this story. Seems like a lot. Seems like nobody I want to sit down and be like, you know, <laughs> ding dong, hello, how are you doing? Let me tell you about Jesus. No, he's a scary dude. He's very, very angry. And Without any context, you kind of go, wow, he's intense. I wonder why. But it's just a few verses, so let me skip to the good part of the story. But before we skip to the good part of the story, my North American Christian mindset wants to know, why? Why is he this intense about this? And so I did a lot of research on Paul. Did you guys know that there's like hundreds of volumes written about Saul of Tarsus? I will go between Saul and Paul. We know him as Paul, but right here it's talking about Saul. Same dude. There are volumes and volumes written about this guy. He's amazing. Born in Tarsus, modern day Turkey, and he was raised to be a Pharisee. He started Hebrew school when he was around 10, and he was studying, eventually his family moved from Tarsus to Jerusalem. So they're living there. He's studying with this famous Rabbi Gamaliel, and he is learning all of the things. Eventually he becomes He's taking a deep dive study into the law. He is passionate about this. In Galatians, he actually talks about how he went further into studies than anyone else. So he is super passionate about this. And something that might be really, really good for us to know and understand why it says he's uttering threats. Some of your translations might actually say that he was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. I, would, I think we can all agree that's intense. And, and he goes and he gets a stack of arrest warrants. Not just one, not just two. Like he's got arrest warrants, plural, so that he can take as many as he can to come back to Jerusalem. So I wanted to know, like I, growing up, thought that it was just a little ways from Jerusalem to Damascus. Has anyone ever looked that up? I'll let you know, haha, <laughs> I looked it up. It's 130 miles. They don't have cars. 130 miles. This is how zealous he is to get these guys taken care of once and for all. He gets a stack of arrest warrants, puts them in his bag, heads on out for a 130 mile trek, which if you're walking at approximately two, two and a half miles an hour, you're gonna get there in 57 hours of nonstop walking. They didn't nonstop walk clearly because you've got eating and sleeping and other things you might need to do along the way. So scholars estimate that this was a six day walking tour. Him and his buddies who were like, let's go get them. And off they go. Six days of walking. That's a lot of passion. That's a lot of zeal. And what we know of as zeal, we think zeal is passion, right? that you're zealous for something, you're very passionate and excited. That term back in the day, zealous, was equal to violent. To be a zealot meant that you were not just passionate for Judaism, it meant that you were a soldier for Judaism, that you were willing to do whatever it took to make sure that God's ways were followed. So this is his mindset as he's walking and he has learned, he was raised with this fierce obedience to ancestral traditions. He was taught to urge other Jews to do the same and to acknowledge that the God of Israel would send Messiah and that Messiah would come as a strong 
warrior savior to raise up an army. We've heard this before, right? When we went through the book of John and we were hearing how they misinterpreted what Messiah meant. Well, if they misinterpreted, how much more so a zealot who is like, I will do whatever it takes. God's way will be the way. And I know that Jesus, that Messiah will come in strength and power. And this Messiah that they're speaking of did not come in strength and power, right? So Saul's like, "Mm -mm, this ain't happening. So his job in his mind is to take out the people of the way. One author says, Saul of Tarsus was brought up to believe that the Messiah would come and perhaps very soon. He was also taught that there were things that Jews could be doing in the meantime to keep this promise and hope on track. It was vital for Jews to keep the Torah with rigorous attention to detail and to defend the Torah and the temple itself no matter what against all possible attacks and threats. Failure on these points would hold back the promised Messiah. So his every breath was to keep this safe. From Saul's point of view, these first followers of Jesus were a prime example of deviant behavior that had to be snuffed out. Anything and everything had to be done to get rid of the disciples of the way. See, throughout Israel's history, we can look through the Old Testament and through the intertestamental times, the historians that kept records between the Old Testament and the New Testament, there was time there. And Saul had learned about people like Phinehas, not Phineas and Ferb, Phinehas. (laughs) And if you would like some fun reading, if you're done watching TV and just wanna watch something or read about something fun, read Numbers 25 about Phinehas. It's crazy, I'll save that for another time. But there's Phinehas who saved everybody with a really good throw of his spear and ends a rebellion. And then there's Elijah with the prophets of Baal and read that story. There's a lot of insanity and bloodshed there. And then in the intertestamental period, there's Judas Maccabees who was known as Judas the Hammer. He and his brothers formed a little revolutionary group against the powerful pagan empire of Syria. And they, against all odds, they succeed. They fight against the Syrians, they reconsecrate the temple, and established for a century or so an independent Jewish state. Zeal worked, violence worked. Saul knows this, and so he knows that he is on a mission for God. And with this zeal, he has set out to go to Damascus, all the way, because he knows God himself, the one true God is under attack. He was fighting for God and doing the right thing. But in all of this learning, and all of this stuff that I found out about Saul, and crazy life that he lived, and, and I mean, I could go on for days and days, but I won't, because it's a lot, it's really cool. If you ever wanna know anything fun, just come ask me. But Saul is not the main character in this story. That's what's super cool about this. I bet you guys might know, because last week when we talked about the Ethiopian eunuch, and when we talked about Philip, and when we talked about Stephen, those aren't the main characters, are they? It's God. So God very quickly and succinctly comes into this story, comes into our journey, and he takes back over. And so let's look at how drastically Saul's journey is about to change, because he's coming up on Damascus. He's making his way there. He's almost made it. And as he's approaching Damascus on this mission, a light from heaven suddenly shone down around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. And the voice replied, I am Jesus, the one you're persecuting. Jesus makes it very clear. You think you're doing the right thing, but that's not it. I am the one that you're persecuting. I am the one. I mean, can you imagine how shocked he must have been? Falls on the ground, struck down by this brilliant light that in another, in Acts 26, he says it was brighter than the sun. Knocks him to the ground with the glory of God. But he still doesn't recognize right away, who are you, Lord? Probably a really good question that we should all ask sometimes when we question things, but who are you, Lord? 
well, I'm Jesus, the one you're persecuting. And Jesus doesn't mince words. Jesus isn't like, oh, I'm so sorry that you're scared. Because I can imagine that this is terrifying. Because it talks about the, his companions who don't see anything but hear a voice. Now, they're not on the ground. It doesn't record that. They're just kind of like standing there going, what in the world is going on? This is not like an ooh, fuzzy, warm, happy church moment. This is a, I'm going to knock you down and let you know that you're wrong. And he doesn't mince words. He says, now get up and go, and I'll tell you what you're going to do next. Sir, yes, sir. I mean, Saul needed that. He did not need somebody, he didn't need Jesus to be flowery. He didn't need Jesus to be, oh, come on, precious son, let's go. No, he needed to be knocked on his face and then to say, get up and do this. This is what I'm in charge now. And now Saul sees, oh, oh, this Jesus is, is strong. Oh, oh, this Jesus is in charge. Oh, things change very drastically because God steps into the story. We've been seeing these concentric circles as Luke tells this story, how the gospel is being brought to both the likely and now the very unlikely hearts. He talks about the excluded Samaritans who rejoice because they're being brought back to God's table after so long of assuming that they're not qualified. And there's rejoicing. Luke tells us, tells us of a Gentile who is seeking and who finds, and there's great rejoicing. So much so that he's like, whoa, stop the cart, I need to get baptized. And now Luke is telling us about a Jew who thinks that he's in the right, but he's actually the enemy. He's persecuting Jesus himself. Paul is the most unlikely convert of all time. And it takes Jesus to knock him down, to say, why are you persecuting me? Not just why are you persecuting the church, why are you persecuting me? In its infancy, the church is beginning with the most unlikely turned missionary. Eventually, we'll see that in the next couple chapters. If you get nothing else today, I really hope that you can walk away knowing that God can change the most unlikely of hearts. I know that's very simple. And I know it's very easy for us to say amen and for us to whoop, whoop, be excited about that one. But it's not so easy to really apply that, to let that be one of your deeply held beliefs when you're being bullied for your beliefs at work, when you're mocked by your neighbors or even your own family members for how you believe and how you live your life. I'm here to tell you there's hope. I'm gonna tell you again so that you really hear this, God can change the most unlikely of hearts. And he does it on his terms. Is see, if God can change Paul's most unlikely murderous heart, then he can change your boss, your antagonistic PTA chairperson, even those people that you're not sure you wanna spend eternity with. God wants to spend eternity with them, and he can knock them down and say, why are you persecuting me? But can I tell you something I, I see in this? That was not Ananias' job. Side note, another sermon for another time. It was God's job. Because Saul was one of those people, and Jesus came for him. Those people that we're not so sure about, that the church wasn't even that sure about, even when they had heard about it. Ananias, ha <laughs> you sure God? I mean, he kind of has an arrest warrant for me, just saying. The guy's like, yeah, I got that. Do it. And Jerome is very soon gonna get to the point in Acts where Paul comes to the church and they are not ready for him. Can you imagine? Here's the guy who had all the arrest warrants and he's come to preach because he found Jesus. And how many of you would be sitting there going, <laughs> right? I smell something fishy, like something to me says that he has a plan and we're all gonna end up in jail because he's just trying some covert new tactic. And it was hard for them. I'm not gonna take his sermon. That's really hard. Sorry, I'll stop. 
It's so exciting. I told you I love a good story. He'll come to that. He was one of those people, those guys. So if God can change the most unlikely of hearts, if God can take Saul and totally change him, what does that mean for us? What do we do? Well, the first thing I would beg of you, don't give up on the unlikely hearts. I know it's hard. I've been around those people. I am related to some of those people when you just don't want to be in the same room, in the same hemisphere. <laughs> like, you know, it'd be really great if one of us moved. <laughs> That'd be great. You go south, I'll go north, you go east, I'll go west, I don't care, pick one. But God says don't give up on them. Don't give up. Pray for those who need Jesus. Pray for those who are so hard to love. Because the more you pray for someone, the more you see them the way that Jesus sees them, the more you see an image bearer, and the less you see your enemy. I could really go into a whole series on this. Another sermon for another day, another series for another day. Don't give up on people. Love people. And then pray some more because that's not our love coming from us. That's not me in the physical being like, I love you. No, that's really hard to do, really hard to do. But what we're charged with is, is to spend time with Jesus and pray so that when God says love, you can love. And then you pray some more because odds are really good that just because you're loving someone doesn't mean you walk away, you don't walk away going, <laughs> Because I, okay, I might be the only super opinionated person in the room who happens to respond sometimes to people that way. And I have to go back and say, Lord, please forgive me for indulging in negative feelings right now and help me love them and see them as your image bearer. And that's why we have to pray a lot. A lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. Probably some of us more than others, that's me. Because it's not our natural inclina inclination to take a beating and keep on going, to take that verbal and just keep going, oh, Jesus loves you so much. Let me love you like Jesus. So that's why we need to pray and not give up, not give up. And the second thing I would say is listen and obey. Philip listened. He was in the middle of like, woohoo, revival. Like, it was amazing, cool things are happening. And the Holy Spirit was like, okay, go to Gaza. And he does. I mean, like, his ministry is really just getting rocking. And now he's on a road walking to Gaza. I did not do the math on that. I don't know how far that is. So he, but they do a lot of walking in the Bible. So he's walking because he listened and he obeyed. He's just a dude who's doing what God says to do. Another thing we learned last week. Even more so, Ananias is just a dude. See, Saul did not receive the gospel from a famous apostle, from a famous teacher, like he had studied under the famous Rabbi Gamaliel. He did not hear the gospel from the famous Peter, the famous John. No, he received it from Jesus Christ himself. And then Jesus came to just a dude, Ananias, and said, hey Ananias, and he knew that voice so well. That when he sees this vision, we don't say, we don't read him going, oh, what is this? No, he said, yes, Lord. Like it's a totally normal thing. It is not a normal thing for me to just have a vision of the Lord speaking to me. I might be a little weirded out by that. Be like, who's in the kitchen with me? Nope, Ananias was like, yes, Lord. Ananias, I want you to go to Straight Street. Okay, knock on the door, gotcha. Ask for a man from Tarsus. Hmm, okay, his name is Saul, nope. Like, this would be me, um, and even an Ananias is like, huh, I, you know that man, right? Like, heads up, God, he's bad news. And God's like, heads up, I know. And, but I want you to go, because I've chosen him. And he's going to bring my message to the Gentiles, to kings, to Israel. And I'm going to tell him how much he has to suffer. I wonder if part of Ananias went, yeah. 
just, you know, the little fleshly side of me and goes, is he sitting there going, yeah, just like the rest of us, you have to suffer. He probably didn't, that's just me. And he was like, okay, and you know what, when he comes to Saul, I love this, he goes and it's not like he's, hey, um, Saul, I just want you to know, Jesus loves you, bye. No, it says he comes up to him and lays hands on him. This is how much he trusts God. He is willing to go up to a murderer, a zealot who has arrest warrants and can take him out right then and there and be so close that he puts his hands on him and says, Brother Saul, not just, hey, yo, stranger, it's brother, you've been brought in the family. Tell me he hasn't learned to love like Jesus loves. Tell me he hasn't spent time with Jesus. Because when you spend time with Jesus, you haven't given up on the unlikely. And he says, all right, God, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to obey. And he does it, and Saul receives the Holy Spirit. Saul is healed. Saul gets up and gets baptized, and Saul ends up writing the majority of the New Testament, becomes a missionary, changes the world because God got involved and because Ananias listened and obeyed, even when it was scary, even when it was hard, and he did what God told him to do. And God didn't make it all flowers and sunshine from that point on. He continued with the unlikely. And that's why he needed Saul, to do the unlikely. So listen and obey, because there's gonna be a day when God says, Martha, yes Lord, here's what you're gonna do. And you have to be ready, you have to be willing, even when it's that neighbor two houses down that is the worst. And God says, they need you right now. And you have to be willing to say, okay, God, got this. Whatever you say, I'm going to do. And that's what Ananias was willing to do. He was willing to obey. Because he knew that he wasn't the main character. He wasn't the one doing the work, right? God was clearly in charge of all of that. And we get that really confused sometimes because we misunderstand the boundaries aspect of that and we forget that we're responsible to share to, not for. We're not responsible for how they will respond. Our job is to obey. It's up to them whether they respond. They may not. Not every story ends like Saul. It'd be really cool if it did. But sometimes God's still working on people, and sometimes people go to people. And they're gonna be like, nope, no thanks. But that's not a rejection of you. That's their heart choosing to say no to Jesus. And if we can remember that, it makes it so much easier to listen and obey. So much easier. Because it's not my responsibility to make them do anything. It's my responsibility to just obey. There are some wise words that I learned as a young teenager from the band, The Newsboys. Try as you may, there is no way to explain the kind of change that would make an Eskimo renounce fur that would make a vegetarian barbecue a hamster. So shine and make them wonder what you've got. I know those are silly lyrics, but sometimes you have to go to the, si the silly to really drive home a point that it's not up to you, that's the Holy Spirit's job. Your job is to not give up and to listen and obey. Ooh, so simple, so simple. Why do I wanna go for complicated sometimes when Jesus is like, could you just get this part down? Yes, sir, I can do that. Now, you may be here today and you're like, this is great and I'm so glad that you guys are all getting this lecture on what you should do because this is definitely a sermon meant for Christians. And if you're not a believer today, I'm so glad you're here. You might be here to make your mom happy, which good job, way to go. It probably does make her happy. Or maybe you're just here because you're driving by thinking, hey, I wanna check that place out. So glad you're here and I'm glad you're checking us out. And I wanna let you know that I would love for you to encounter Christ. 
just like Saul. Okay, not just like Saul. That might be a little dramatic <laughs> and terrifying. If you need that, I'm not Jesus. But I hope that you hear that God is someone you can encounter. I won't be able to convince you. No one here, it's not our job to convince you. That's up to the Holy Spirit. But, man, if you only knew what we knew, the hope, the peace. And the Bible says if you seek him, you will find him. If you're just looking for him, you're going to find him. And he's right there ready and waiting, because the gospel message is so simple. It's just that we couldn't make ourselves right with God. So God sent his son to live the life that we couldn't live, to die the death that we deserved, and in rising again, conquered that death forever. So that we can be made right with God, so that we can spend eternity with God, so that we can have hope of forgiveness And let me tell you, forgiveness feels so unbelievable that then you realize that, wow, I owe God everything. And he just gives love and patience. And that's how much he loved you, so much. So yeah, sometimes we're a little like overexcited about it because man, if you only knew, if you only knew, But you can know if you just say, all right, so they say I should seek you. I'm gonna gonna try. So all you have to do is try. He's not super pushy, I promise. I might be overly excitable, but unless you're Saul, then he's really pushy. But I invite you to consider him today. Even though some of you might just be asking, why would we do any of this? I kinda like my life the way it is, minus the really pressureful, pressurized parts because God can change the most unlikely of hearts. When you don't see how it can be possible, there's hope. If there is hope for Paul, there's hope for your belligerent neighbor. If there is hope for Paul, there's hope for your boss. If there is hope for Paul, there's hope for your child who's walked away from the faith that you raised them in. If there was hope for Paul, there's hope for your spouse. There's hope. In all of this pressure, there's hope because God can change the most unlikely of hearts. And he doesn't just change it, it's not just one and done. It's a changing, it's a transforming, it's a beautiful becoming more like him every day. It's knowing that it's all him. He's the main character. He's the main character in Saul's conversion story. I mean, Saul gets like two verses and then God takes over because he's the main character. Ananias gets a few verses, but that's not the biggest deal because God is the one in that story because God changes the most unlikely of hearts. Be free in that, knowing that it's not you, it's God. That's what gave the early church that freedom to be able to live in Christ and to be able to say, okay, God, I'll go to the street called straight. Nope, yep, straight street. That would be confusing. I'll do it because you said to, because they could trust him because they knew this. That's the power of the gospel. Would you stand with me? We're gonna, we're gonna sing this song, Worthy. And this song to me is so phenomenal because I can, I can just hear this being sung in heaven. It's just worthy is your name. I mean, we're gonna spend all of eternity saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And we're gonna be able to worship and we're gonna be in his presence. And how amazing if we can look across and see one of those people 
who are saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty because they encountered Christ, because they met with Jesus, because we listened and obeyed, because we didn't give up on the unlikely. And sometimes there are voices that are so loud you feel like they're trying to drown you out. Don't give up. Don't give up praying. Praying for all of those unlikelies. In a world of a lot of unlikelies, God put us here for a reason and a purpose. So that you can encounter unlikelies because we were each unlikely. Let's pray, Lord, thank you. Thank you that you put us where you've put us. Thank you that we have the opportunity to share you. Thank you for your word that reminds us that you're the main character, that it's not up to us, that it's up to you. God, give us the strength to lean into you and to listen and obey. Help us glorify you. Thank you for this recording of the early church that you've given us so that we're reminded of what you've done and be encouraged with what you're going to do. Lord, we pray right now for hearts to turn to you we pray that you would open people's eyes to see you, to encounter you, that hearts would be softened, that ears would be opened so that they could hear your voice calling out to them. Lord, I pray for changed hearts and that we would love you more as we say, worthy, worthy.